Hello and a very warm welcome to our online service for today, Sunday the 14th of June. My name is Stuart Coxedge, I'm team vicar in the parish for those who don't know me. Now this Sunday our service comes from St John the Evangelist Church, East Holm, and we also have some members of the East Holm congregation taking part in our service. I'm also excited uh, to say that we have a guest preacher today and later in the service we look forward to hearing from Archdeacon Anthony, the Archdeacon of Dorset, who has recorded a sermon for us today. So thank you to Archdeacon Anthony and to all who have taken part in this recorded service for this Sunday. Now the church here at East Holm around the walls is adorned with many wonderful verses of scripture, including up here on my left, where we read the words from the book of Job, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And so we begin this morning by singing together, There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son. Now we take a few moments of quiet as we come to our Heavenly Father to confess our sins. Heavenly Father, we confess to you our selfishness and lack of love. Fill us with your Spirit. Lord, have mercy. We confess to you our fear and failure in sharing our faith. 
fill us with your Spirit. Christ, have mercy. We confess to you our stubbornness and lack of trust. Fill us with your Spirit. Lord, have mercy. And may God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive you your sins and make you holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the collect for this Sunday. Let us pray. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Shortly, Archdeacon Anthony will be preaching to us, but before that, we hear a reading from the Bible, read by Ven Goldsack. This is the reading today from Matthew chapter 9, verse, verse 35, until chapter 10, finishing at verse 8. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him, and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits 
and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Don't go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Anthony McCrewood. I'm the Archdeacon of Dorset and it's a delight to be able to join you for morning worship today. Now, this morning's Gospel majors on healing. And before I say more, I want to acknowledge the huge debt of gratitude we owe to NHS staff for the way they have risen to the challenge of COVID-19. Many have worked long hours and at great personal risk with inadequate PPE and a disproportionate number have paid the ultimate price. It has served to inspire us and reinvigorate our love for the NHS. So a big thank you to all health workers, both in hospitals and also in care homes. Healing today, though, is big business. Hospitals are getting bigger and better, equipped with the latest technology science can invent and money can buy. New treatments, new drugs, new approaches are being pioneered all the time. Such breakthroughs take time and energy. The buildings, the, mes- the medicines, the research are all expensive. Even before COVID-19 and what it has done to waiting lists, the NHS was finding it more difficult than ever to fund the treatments which are needed And as waiting lists grew longer, medical staff were feeling frustrated, caught between the limitations placed upon them and the ever-expanding expectations of patients. And prior to the crisis, though, many patients were beginning to feel reduced to statistics as cases defined by their medical problem and a statistic to be processed to achieve a government target, rather than being treated as a person, an individual made in the image of God. Despite the best efforts of medical staff, some patients felt reduced to feeling just the sum of their individual parts, rather like a car in for servicing, whilst their emotional and spiritual needs, which may well underlie their physical conditions, were not being addressed. Many conscientious medical staff did their best, with limited resources, to combat this reductionism. But in the end, it can become a survival mechanism for health professionals to fall back on the Western world's dominant model of healing, which treats people like biological machines, a machine which can be helped to function by the application of the appropriate chemical inputs. But then along came COVID-19, and it's turned our lives upside down. We're not used to a pandemic illness causing economies to shrink by 20%, and completely disrupting ordinary life. It's like a science fiction film. Indeed, the 1918-19 Spanish flu was probably the last time anything like this impacted our country. It has shaken our society to the core, but it has helped to bring out the best in us. The selfless service offered by many NHS and care home staff has inspired us. The way communities have organised to look after the vulnerable in their midst has been equally inspiring. We have recaptured a sense of belonging to each other in community. And in that sense of vulnerability to illness and concern for each other, we have been brought closer to the society of Jesus' day. Jesus, of course, was always concerned for people. In today's gospel, he was going through the cities and villages, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and sickness. The proclamation of the good news went hand in hand with concern for their spiritual, material and physical welfare. And then, overcome by compassion for the crowds whom he perceived to be 
harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, Jesus reacted by commissioning the disciples to go and do as he did. Go and proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. This list of things, curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers and casting out demons is quite formulaic. They were the hallmarks of the messianic era, the age of the rule of God's anointed on earth. This is reinforced by the choice of 12 disciples representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The new people of God, the new Israel. In the ancient world, people's outlook on life was dominated by this list. There was a fear of disease, a fear of death, a fear of being outcast from society and a fear of spiritual malaise. The hallmarks of the messianic era was that people's fear of these things would be removed. They would be free to live in the light and love of God, a life free of anxiety about the future, free to live and enjoy the present moment. This is echoed in a scene in the first Harry Potter book about the mirror in which, which reflects our deepest desires. As an orphan, Harry sees a life with his parents. And Professor Dumbledore says, the happiest man alive looks into the mirror and sees only himself. In other words, such people are content with what they have and are living in the present moment, not fearing the future and not striving after things they imagine will make them happy. And this is a key part of what Jesus means in saying the kingdom of heaven is near. A large element is about appreciating the riches we have. But how does this list of things, curing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons and cleansing lepers apply to life today? Firstly, we can affirm then as now, God is concerned with the whole of our lives from cradle to the grave and beyond. It matters to God if we are ill and we should see the work of health professionals as part of God's action in the world. God works through them to bring healing, but God goes further in wanting to address the whole of our lives. Not for God is the narrow mechanistic view of humans as biological machines. Further, God does not regard this life as the be all and end all. Unlike some health professionals, God does not regard death as a failure, but rather as the gateway to something better. God raised Jesus from the dead to show us, amongst other things, that death is not the end. Secondly, cleansing lepers was about integrating those who were outcasts. Because of their skin blemishes, lepers were thrown out of society to live on the margins, begging for their existence. God wants us to live in healthy communities that include everyone, communities which uh, welcome and seek to integrate those on the margins because God created us as social beings to live in community and not as isolated people. I know someone who spent many years living rough. He started because of a series of horrific events that happened to him and those he loved and unable to cope with the pain, he left all and walked out. His reintegration into society happened because one doctor cared enough to take an interest in him and not just treat a physical condition that caused him to end up in hospital. Now thirdly, quite what the ancients thought unclean spirits were and how they operate is not clear. There is such a thing as possession and there are people today with the ministry of exorcism. But modern insights have helped us to see that much of what was thought of as unclean spirits might today be thought of as the results of psychological and emotional trauma. Elsewhere, when talking about demons, Jesus refers to the problem of casting out a demon who then goes and finds seven mates and they all come and inhabit the newly cleaned out house. This insight of Jesus is pertinent. It is one thing with the aid of counselling to recognise in ourselves inappropriate behaviour patterns caused by psychological and emotional trauma. It is quite another to amend these behaviour patterns. This is because they are deeply ingrained and have become habitual. This is why it's important to invite Jesus into our lives to fill that void and to help us break habits and adopt new patterns of being. This is part of the good news of the arrival of God's kingdom. It is about opening ourselves to God's spirit and allowing that inner transformation 
which reduces the desire towards sinful patterns of behaviour which are destructive. So to draw these thoughts together, the call for disciples to go and be apostles and preach the good news of the kingdom is a call to address people's deepest needs and fears and to proclaim how they can be met in Jesus Christ. It is a call that applies as much to us today as it did to the original 12 disciples. We live in an increasingly dysfunctional society, which all too often turns to the medical profession to provide answers to these needs and fears. We need greater confidence in the good news we have to share, and we need to pray for that same compassion which motivated Jesus to send out the Twelve, praying that it may spur us too to share the good news of the Kingdom. Amen. Our prayers today are led by Robert and Judy McLeish and John Moulton. Let's join together and pray for the world, our government and ourselves. Our Father in heaven, we just pray for the world at the moment in such a difficult situation with the coronavirus everywhere. We think especially of those places where, where medical facilities are so primitive and so scarce. The, the Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh refugee camp, the camps in, in, in East Africa, in South Sudan, in, in Uganda, in the Congo, Malawi. Lord, we pray for those nurses and doctors who have such few resources. Be merciful, we pray, to those who suffer, those who mourn. Lord, in your mercy, accept and hear our prayer. Lord, we bring before you the racial tensions which have found an echo around the world. Forgive us for emphasising our differences instead of our shared humanity and the unfair and unequal way we treat each other. Give us the gift of kindness and understanding and teach us to rejoice in the diversity of your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord, we want to pray for our government. We want to pray for Boris Johnson and, and, and his ministers. They made difficult decisions, Lord, about schools, about jobs, about shops. And we pray for those who have lost their jobs, who have no work, and for those who the decisions that have to be made about what happens next. What happens next, Lord, is such a difficult, difficult decision about health and, and economy. We do thank you for the carers and the surgeons and the nurses and all those helpers who are helping those who are isolated or lonely. Lord, in your mercy. Hear yeah, our prayer. Lord, we pray again for all those who are involved in the Brexit negotiations, both parties, EU and UK. As the pressures of time increase, we pray for skillful and wise negotiators who will listen, be open to fair compromise and make wise judgments. Lord, in your mercy. Hear yeah. our prayer. And in praying for ourselves, Lord, we want to pray for our church, our clergy, especially for Helen Williams, who joined us as curate this week. Give her a really fruitful ministry, we pray, and may she feel a sense of welcome, even though we can't see her at, at the moment. Bless her time with us, Lord, her work and her ministry, her preaching, her praying, and, and with, with us, Lord, we pray. Thank you for her. And we also thank you for the new head teacher appointed this week by unanimous decision at Stobrough School. Thank you for that. And we just pray that she will have fruitful work, Lord, with the children, with this school, with the staff, and with the governors. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the return of our churches this weekend for private prayer. And as life slowly reopens, show us clearly the lessons you've been teaching us through these difficult times. Reshape our thinking about the new norm, the norm of worship, of consideration for others, care for those in needs, support for the bereaved. Show us the Jesus way. Merciful but Father, accept, accept these, these prayers, prayers for the, for the sake, sake of your, of your Son, Son, our, our Saviour, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
brief update on our recent Mission Sunday. Thank you to everyone who supported Mission Sunday with your generous donations to our mission partners. The total amount raised was £9,635, including gift aid, and this will be distributed to the various mission partners overseas and locally in accordance with your requests. We've already received a message of thanks from Ruth Guinness, and we've also received the following message from Terrakeka, where your gifts will go towards the repair of the St Stephen's School roof, recently damaged in a storm. On Thursday, we received the following message from Emmanuel, who is the Diocesan Secretary in Terrakeka. Good morning, my dear beloved in Christ. How are you over there? If possible on Sunday, may you greet all the Christians who accepted to attend the Sunday service in your church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Even though coronavirus is confusing the world, let's all of us say Amen to the Holy Trinity. And as we reach the end of our service, we finish with a prayer of blessing. So may God, who gives patience and encouragement, give you a spirit of unity to live in harmony as you follow Jesus Christ, so that with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.